My name is Jan Nielsen. I'm a member from Islington SWP and a member of Islington XR. And uh, ob for obvious reasons, I'm sure I don't have to point them out, the whole question about the environmental crisis is going to be a theme that runs right through Marxism this year. So it's very appropriate that we start Marxism with today's meeting. Um, Martin, uh, who, uh, Martin Empson is a long-standing member of Manchester uh, Socialist Workers' Party, and people will probably, have, a lot of you I know will probably have already read uh, this book on land and labour, which was, I think, published only, only very recently. And again, now Martin has edited this new book on system change, not climate change, which is a series of articles on the issue. And uh, I'll point out also that in Socialist Review, there is an article on this very topic. Martin's going to speak for 35 minutes. We're going to have a roving mic, so people aren't going to need to come down to the front. So you'll indicate to me uh, once Martin stopped uh, speaking. Um, hello, can you, everyone hear me? Um, I'm glad they've got us a, a big room for this meeting. Come on, it's the only joke you're going to get today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, comrades. Um, I, I'm going to start actually where, um, where Jan um, began, uh, began really, which is the scale of the environmental crisis that we face, the existential threat to humanity, which is now becoming, I would argue, um, real for uh, millions, of, um, millions of people. And as a result, we are starting to see... Uh, vast numbers of uh, people beginning to be engaged in quite militant and radical action around the question of the environment, climate change, biodiversity crisis, extinction, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And um, that's a tremendously exciting thing. I think the climate strikes that it exploded onto the scene follow Gre following Greta Thunberg's uh, uh, call for, uh, for, for school students to take action have been utterly inspirational. Um, and I think following from that in, here in Britain and, and, and now encouraging movements similar around the, around the globe, the, uh, the Extinction Rebellion stuff, both in January and then in, in April, where tens of thousands of people took to the streets, were prepared to engage in uh, direct action, civil disobedience, and get, act, uh, get, get arrested uh, to demand action. I think that's tremendously inspiring for, 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 for those of us who've been environmental activists for many, many, many years. And within those movements, one of the most exciting things, I think, for socialists is the fact that slogans like System Change, Not Climate Change, the title of the new book uh, available on sale at the end, um, is, is one that's quite dominant. It's the sense that people recognise that there's something wrong with the world that we live in, there's something wrong with capitalism, the system that we have, and actually they want something different. They want something... Uh, 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 they want an alternative, and often uh, uh, they don't really know what that might be, but they're prepared to really campaign and fight for it. The problem is, I think, for the left, for the movements, is that those aren't the only arguments, and those aren't the only alternatives. And I've been an environmental campaigner for 30 years now, and I can bet that in most points in that last three decades, uh, while campaigning out uh, around environmental questions, someone has come up to me and said something along the lines of, well, it's all very well you talking about the fossil fuel corporations, or it's all very well you blaming capitalism, but the problem is, is there's too many people. I got a taxi for work yesterday, and the, the taxi driver, who was in no way a right winger, said to me, um, talking about resources, the problem is, is Britain's overcrowded. Look at those vast open spaces of America or Canada, he said. Uh, Britain's overcrowded. We can't cope. And so what this meeting really is about is trying to unpick some of those arguments to argue that actually... The question of population is not the environmental threat that many people put it out to, to explore some of the realities of population in the 21st century and to actually put an alternative. And, but one of the things I want to say first um, is, and this, this is an obvious point, but I think it's important for socialists to say, is that in this meeting, and indeed in, in books you read about the question of population, you will see lots and lots of very big numbers. Um, here's one, 7.6 billion, which is about the population of the, uh, of the Earth, on the Earth today. And in too often, these are numbers become meaningless. They're abstracted from any real context. Here's another one. Um, this is the population predicted by the United Nations for the mid part of this century, 9.8 billion. And 
Sometimes I think what happens is that the people who would like to blame the question of overpopulation simply talk about these numbers and forget that actually these represent individuals, real people, men and women, their families, children, people who've got hopes and aspirations and dreams, uh, people who've got worries and fears, are worried about lack of work or underemployment, people who might be engaged in protest movements or trying to change the world. Uh, and all too often, uh, those people who blame population levels for environmental crisis or hunger or, or so on, as we'll come on to, actually forget that reality. And indeed what they do is they show us images like this. And this is one, I think, the first or the second image that you get when you Google overpopulation uh, 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 and, and look for, for pictures. I mean, what is this? I mean, are these people on their way home or uh, commuting to or from work? Are they, uh, are they perhaps complaining and protesting about public transport? Are they on, at a festival? Actually, what is really behind the scenes, often when you see images like this, is the question of population really is code for too many poor people and too many Asian or black people. And really, I want to try and unpick some of these arguments. Um, I should say from the, uh, the outset, though, that I think while in general the question of overpopulation does come from the right wing, it's not entirely a right wing argument. Um, I think for some people it's a common sense argument. Uh, and there are people on the, on the left, uh, as, as we will see, who certainly... Uh, do, 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 to say this, this sort of thing. Um, that said, it is quite prevalent. It's not dominant, but I think it is quite prevalent in the, uh, in the environmental movement. Here's a picture taken by a, a comrade of ours uh, from the school student strike, the last one in, in London. It shows um, some young um, gay activists uh, with, with, the, with the slogan, go, go, go gay for the planet. The implication being, if you're gay, you won't have children, and thus this, uh, uh, this will be a step forward for the, for, the, for, for the planet. I've got nothing against people going gay for any reason at all, but I think the... Um, uh, the point really has to be that this is, becomes, for some people, an extension of the argument that individual action can make a, make a difference to saving the, uh, saving the, uh, the world. And so what I'm going to do in this meeting is twofold, really. Firstly, I'm going to challenge some of the perceptions and common sense ideas around population. Um, and uh, uh, secondly, I'm then going to uh, explore whether population does lead to environmental destruction, and if it doesn't, what the alternatives uh, uh, are. are. So firstly, let's take um, a, 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 an example of how these arguments manifest themselves. Recently, the United Nations released a report that said that of the 8, billion species, sorry, the 8 million species on the planet, around a million of them face immediate extinction. Um, this is the, uh, their explanation, this is the United Nations words about the causes of this, the drivers for this. Key and direct drivers include increased population and per capita consumption, technological innovation, which in some cases has lowered and in other cases has increased the damage to nature, and critically, issues of governance and accountability. There's a whole number of things there, interrelated causes and, uh, and reasons. But in many popular accounts of that report, the sort of lurid front pages that you, uh, that, that, that you get around this question, actually what happens is the question of population dominates. Here, for instance, writing in the Financial Times under the headline, Clever Science Alone Cannot Prevent the Next, next Mass Extinction, is the journalist Camilla Cavendish. She warns us. Uh, the UN warn us that a human overpopulation is harming the very plant and animal species on which we rely for survival. It is irresponsible to welcome the UN report with warm words while promoting increases in population. We started a war with nature to survive, but if we do not call a truce now, the losers will be us. And Camilla Cavendish is making... Actually, it's a bit rude of me, isn't it? Baroness Cavendish of Little Venice <laughs> is making a number of, um, uh, of, of mistakes in that um, thing. She's uh, focusing down on a single issue that the UN argued was a driver, was a factor in the causes of, uh, of, of it, and, and actually goes on to argue a series of arguments around um, uh, 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 why overpopulation is the main driving course of all. But of course, for someone who's married to the senior advisors of the Bank of England and um, is a peer in the House of Lords, uh, you might expect her to have a, 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 a particular agenda here. However, while she may and does have an agenda, I would argue, um, it, it, she reflects, I think, a common sense ap approach to the question of environmental uh, destruction. And, and you can put it very simply like this. A uh, number of people equals a certain amount of destruction to the environment. More people equals more destruction to the environment. More people means more extinction, more biodiversity loss, more deforestation. More people means more cars, more pollution, more uh, uh, waste, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. It's a, it's a common sense argument, and, and superficially seems to, seems to be fairly uh, accurate. It's not a new argument. Um, 
uh, back in 1798, uh, uh, a man that I'm sure many people have heard the name of, Thomas Robert Malthus, wrote a, uh, a series of articles, the essays on uh, Prince, Essay on the Principle of Population, which he revised over the coming decades, uh, where he argued that population growth, human population growth, was inevitable, that people would always attempt to have as many children as they possibly could, and that this population growth was of an order that would, would always automatically outstrip the available food, um, food supply. Um, Malthus was very influential. I'll, I'll come back to some of what he said a little bit later on. Um, more recently, um, following the growing and a sort of, how can I say, the explosion and in interest in the environmental crisis in the 1960s, a number of authors took up these arguments from both the left and from the right, some of them pushing the idea that overpopulation was the driving force of environmental destruction, hunger, and a whole number of other issues around uh, resource uses. Um, the American academic, Paul Ehrlich, uh, wrote a, 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 an infamous book, a book that became enormously popular, called The Population Bomb, um, in 1971. Um, and he wrote this. Think of what it means for the population of a country to double. The food available for the people must be doubled. Every structure and road must be duplicated. The amount of power used is doubled. The capacity of the transport system must be doubled. The number of trained doctors, nurses, teachers and administrators must be doubled. Now, I'm going to leave aside a, a glaring problem with that, which is actually I don't think if the population does double, you need necessarily to double the welfare state or the number of roads or trains or someone. I don't think that's how society, society works. But what really Ehrlich was trying to do was a crude equation between growth in population and resource use and technology and consumption and so on. Um, and he particularly focused on two issues, environment and, uh, environmental destruction and, uh, and, and hunger. The logic of this, of course is that if you think that population is growth is problem, or it's the population is too large, then actually you have to then say, well, maybe the population should be reduced or stabilised. Um, the British environmental writer and uh, activist James Lovelock, who's most, know, most well known for the Gaia hypothesis, um, says that he thinks the Earth can only sustain a population of one billion people. Um, he doesn't say anything else what's going to happen to the other 6.6 .6 billion. Um, it's uh, an important question, uh, which he neatly sidesteps. David Attenborough. All our this is a quote, all our environmental problems become easier to solve with fewer people and harder and ultimately impossible to solve with ever more people. Um, I don't want to suggest that either David Attenborough or James Lovelock are advocating mass genocide or the mass forcible reduction of the population, but I do think there are people in society, I think the far right, the Nazi organisation, fascist organisations and so on, do seize upon these arguments and use them as a justification uh, for arguing precisely uh, for, um, uh, for, 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 for genocide. Um, they, too many people leads easily to too many migrants or too many immigrants or too many Muslims and, uh, and so on. And at heart, I think these arguments are a right-wing view of society. Uh, they're a right-wing view of how society is and, um, and, and, and how it causes environmental problems. Uh, Frederick Engels, Marx's collaborator and lifelong friend, summed up Robert Malthus like this. The earth is perennially overpopulated, whence poverty, misery, distress and immorality must prevail. It's the lot, the eternal destiny of mankind, to exist in two great numbers and in diverse classes of which some are rich, educated and moral and others are more or less poor, distressed, ignorant and immoral. Um, and so, I, and I should also add as well, people like Paul Ehrlich and, and other writers since often use uh, the Population Bomb book is, is riddled with uh, anti-communist concerns about revolution and uprisings and, uh, and, uh, and so on. And so to understand really the question of population and the environment, we also have to understand the question of population itself and, uh, and what's going on. And one of the important things to stress at this point is that really the reality, almost from the moment that Malthus put pen to paper, and certainly, as you'll see, from the moment that uh, Paul Ehrlich published his book, the predictions that they were making about the future and about population growth and resource use um, utterly failed to come true. For instance, uh, Ehrlich famously uh, postulated that the 19, he would say that in the 1980s most the majority of the world would be, uh, would be starving. Now, um, I'm pretty sure that many comrades will remember the 1980s. There were horrific famines in sub-Saharan Africa, Ethiopia, for instance, um, and they were horrible for millions and millions of people, but it's not true that most of the world was, um, was starving. And the countries that did starve, there were there was drought, severe drought in 31 uh, sub-Saharan Africa's and mid-19... Uh, sub-Saharan African countries in the mid-1980s, um, not all of those suffered famine. The ones that did suffer famine were the ones that couldn't afford to buy food. The people who died of hunger or went, um, uh, uh, went hungry did so because of poverty, not because of 
overpopulation. Um, and it's still, of course, a scandal that millions of people starve or are hungry in the world. The United Nations say that uh, about 10.7% 10, 10 of the world's population are, uh, are, are classed as hungry, 815 million people. It's a condemnation of, of a society that can produce vast quantities of food and, uh, and uh, can't feed the, 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 the hung hungry. Um, but in contradiction to those who argue that growth in population directly leads to more people, which means to more, more hunger, the number of pop uh, hungry people in the world is dropping. Um, since the early 1990s, uh, uh, the number of hungry people in the world has dropped by around 200 million, uh, million people. And, and um, Ian Angus and Simon Butler, whose book, uh, Too Many People, is one of the, the best books on this subject, make the point very explicitly that there are, uh, uh, more, there's more than enough food in the world to, uh, to feed both the current population and future projections. Um, so let's have a look at some of the uh, realities of population growth. I'm going to show you some, some, uh, some graphs. Uh, feel free to fall, if, uh, fall asleep if you, these things bore you. Um, I, would, I do want to thank um, the author Danny Dawling for the permission to use these, uh, these graphs from his book, uh, Ten, Population 10 Billion. It's a really interesting book. Um, this, this book shows a number of uh, uh, this, this graph, rather, shows a number of um, different things. Uh, I, I won't go through all of them, um, but, but I suppose the most important thing to spot is that on the left here, uh, uh, the population from 1950 onwards grows um, and reaches a point around about here, uh, where we've got our 7.6 billion, um, just there. Um, and then there is a number of predictions. These are from the United Nations about what might happen. This extreme one here at the top is not going to happen. This is an outlier based on... Uh, uh, unchanging fertility. Um, really the important ones are these three here which show the, uh, uh, the median one in the middle, the expected outcome 10.1 billion by 2100. These da data have been slightly superseded by later reports um, uh, or a declining population or a slightly bigger population here. The important thing is, is that the most likely outcome of population growth is to uh, reach a peak and then plateau off and possibly decline after the end of this, uh, end of this uh, century. Um, Having said that, this graph also hides a multitude of other things that you can't see. Um, firstly, that in a number of parts of the world, and in, an increasing number of parts of the world over the beginning of the next, uh, over the next 50 years or so, population will decline. Um, Europe, China, Japan are all expected to have declining um, population um, by the mid part of this century and, uh, and onward. More importantly for our discussion today, almost all the population growth you'll see from this point to the height will take place in either sub-Saharan Africa or the Indian subcontinent. Um, these will, um, uh, the growth will be very limited to a short, small number of parts of the world. Um, and it's almost an iron demographic law um, that uh, population with increased affluence, with better access to education, uh, uh, healthcare, the, uh, more availability of contraception, access to abortion and so on, uh, women choose to have smaller numbers of, uh, of, of children. And this is behind the declining in fertility, we'll come back to that, and the uh, decrease in population. Um, here's another graph, um, a slightly more complicated one. Um, it's, in fact, it's two graphs, just to make things that's not it. Um, here we have two graphs. One of the big thick line is the world population. These dots represent the size of it. This, the, the figures here at the bottom, uh, are behind, if you like, this fader graph, is more interesting. This is not rise and fall of population. What this is is the change in the rate of population growth. When it's going upwards, population growth is accelerating. When it's going downwards, population growth is uh, slowing down. Um, and what you'll see is that uh, social circumstances, economics, politics impact upon uh, the average population change in the world. These two big dips here are the First and Second World War and the uh, influenza epidemic, because in wartime when men are at the front or are being killed, uh, people choose to have less children. They're worried about their future. They're not thinking it's a good idea or there aren't enough partners. Um, this here is the Chinese famine. But what's interesting is up here, this peak here, number seven, um, it's labelled here the end of global population acceleration. It could also be labelled the point when Rob Paul Ehrlich wrote his book about how the world population was going to grow out of control because 1971 <laughs> is the peak of the acceleration of growth. From that point onwards, the rate of growth of population declines very, um, uh, very, 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 very dramatically um, in, uh, indeed. It's a completely different reality to those people like my taxi driver who believe that population growth is accelerating uncontrollably and uh, will never be able to do things. Um, I'm going to skip on to this next slide just because I think it's useful background information and we'll move on to the second part of the talk. This is uh, fertility rates, the number of children that women 
have had. Um, the different lines represent, uh, I don't know how well you can see at the back, different parts of the world. The thick line in the middle is the world total fertility rate. So in 1950, uh, on average, women are having five children around the world. Today, they're having just under two. Um, in Africa, in 1950, they were having about six and a half children. Uh, today, they're having, uh, uh, where are we, um, what's that, four and a half, and are predicted to decline. And so all parts of the world are approaching a, a, a level of around two. This is quite interesting. Um, the figure that's considered the, 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 the replacement level for fertility is 2.1 children. And if a country, uh, these are big approximations, but if a country is having, uh, on average, less children per women than 2.1, uh, population will, 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 will reduce over, over, over time. I mention that because Baroness Cavendish of Little Venice has got three. Um, <laughs> And uh, by her own argument, is contributing quite dramatically to the problem. <laughs> um, fertility is a, uh, thus is a product of decisions made by women and, and, and men um, that is primarily driven by the wealth of the society that they're living in, their access to, uh, uh, to resources and, uh, and so on. And in poorer parts of the world, like Sub-Saharan Africa, which we mentioned as being one of the principal places that population growth will dramatically increase in the next uh, 50 to 100 years, uh, poorer economies are, are places where women are more likely to have more children. It's a safeguard against older age. Uh, 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 it's a, um, uh, a safeguard against high levels of infant mortality and so on. As an aside, I just want to mention um, that the drop in fertility rates in places like Europe is going to lead to... Um, uh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, a drop in fertility rates is going to lead to some problems for some countries. In, uh, in Italy, where the uh, far-right anti-immigrant population... Uh, politicians want to uh, ban immigration at all. If there was no immigration to Italy um, at all, the, pop the current population of around 61 million will drop to 45 million by the year 2050. Vast areas, well, big areas of Italy will become relatively depopulated. And countries like Germany, rich countries which are seeing ageing populations, uh, uh, will see a, both a smaller population and a much older population. And without immigration, those countries will lack support. One of the reasons that Paul Ehrlich wrote The Population Bomb was, as I said, that the 1960s saw a growing awareness uh, around the world around the questions of environmental issues. This was uh, Paul Ehrlich's book was uh, uh, contemporary with books by Barry Commoner or, 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 or Rachel Carson that looked at causes of particular aspects of the environmental crisis. <laughs> Um, and these were quite, quite severe. We, we're concerned today about things like uh, uh, climate change and biodiversity and so on, air pollution and water pollution and so on. But in the 1960s, there were, was growth, growing awareness of these crises and uh, a real fear about what was causing things like air pollution, smog, uh, 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 pollution of rivers, uh, uh, the oceans and, uh, and so on. And Paul Ehrlich in The Population Bomb basically blames all of these on population growth. And he's challenged by a number of other, other writers at the time. Um, but really puts, a, a cr as I said, quite a crude argument that more people means more, more pollutions. Um, and um, I think this is also true today. We'll come up more, I'll mention it a bit at the end. But um, uh, there's an article in um, The Guardian a few weeks ago that said that the demand for meat was leading directly to the, uh, to the, uh, to the destruction of the Amazon rainforest and that growing population meant that more people were eating meat, which would mean that there was more uh, uh, destruction of the rainforest. And Paul Ehrlich used... Um, actually, as a number of other writers did, a, a case study in, uh, in his book of Los Angeles um, and the enormous crisis that they uh, faced from the Second World War onwards about smog. And Paul Ehrlich basically says, well, the problem is, is that Los Angeles in the 1960s is in a rapidly expanding city. It was. More and more people were going there, working there, and so on. And, and he said, each of these people comes, and they, they buy a car, and then they drive it, or they buy two cars, and they both drive it, and, uh, and that leads to, to more smog. Look, population growth is equaling pollution. The problem is, is actually the smog in uh, Los Angeles was caused by the city growing, but it was also caused by a very conscious decision taken to change how people moved around the city. The expansion of the suburbs in the, uh, in the 1960s was done through the building of mo uh, freeways and, uh, and roads, and people were encouraged to buy their own car by the automobile industry, and the American state was operating in the interests of the automobile industry and so on. And the previous low-pollution uh, electric trams were left to wither on the vine and not expanded at all, and in fact the tram companies switched to buses because it was more profitable to run buses. And the trams now, uh, I've never been to Los Angeles, but I believe that they don't 
they don't exist anymore. And, um, and, and, and so the point was, is that what was driving the growth of car use in the city and the pollution that resulted as that was conscious political and economic decisions around the nature of public transport in that, uh, in that city as opposed to simply the growth of, uh, of, uh, of, of population. Um, and that actually point is completely missed by Paul Ehrlich. There's nothing in that about his discussions. And you can make the same arguments around the question of agriculture. The nature of agriculture in the 1960s changes dramatically to use more fertilizers, more chemicals, becomes uh, by default more, more, more polluting. There's a, there's a slightly cruder argument about, uh, around this, which is around the, uh, the argument of per capita uh, emissions, um, which I just want to mention because it is used often on the left. I'm not sure it's an adequate response to this. Uh, Fred Pierce in his book um, People Quite says, for instance, the poorest 3 billion or so people on the planet, about 45% in total, are currently responsible for only 7% of emissions, while the richest 7%, about half a billion, are responsible for 50% of emissions. Um, it's an important point. Populate, you know, 100 extra people in India or 100 extra people in sub-Saharan Africa will not have the carbon footprint of 100 extra people living in, in Los Angeles, for instance. Um, I, th I think it's, it's problematic because it, 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 it approaches the question from individual consumptions. I, I suspect, for instance, that my carbon footprint is much, much smaller than Baroness Cavendish of Little Venice. Um, and, and I think that's probably true of all, all, all of the other people in this room. But also, I think it masks another problem, which is the, uh, that sometimes the left uh, focus on, which is the question of consumption rather than, um, than, than production in society. I would argue that the real driver of pollution in, in society is... Um, is, is the nature of capitalist production. Capitalist production, which I'm sure comrades uh, will, will have realised, drives to produce ever more um, goods and commodities, which it then encourages us to buy, the whole fashion in, uh, in, uh, in, in purchasing and, and so on. Something that's existed from the early days. Here's a, a quote from a 1929 marketing consultant. I bet you didn't think marketing consultants existed in 1929, but they did. It is the ambition of almost every American to practice progressive obsolescence as a ladder by which to grime, gl climb to ever greater human satisfaction through the purchases of more fascinating and thrilling range of goods and services being offered uh, today. Um, it's that sort of thing, I think, that's behind the drive to, uh, uh, to, 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 to cause environmental uh, destruction. And actually, the problem in terms of pollution, whether it's Los Angeles or globally, is, uh, is, is one of society, it's, uh, and, it, and it requires social movements to challenge it. And indeed, what stopped pollution, what stopped the smog question in, in Los Angeles was a, an active environmental campaigning of, uh, of, of residents, of concerned scientists, of activists, and so on, who, who challenged the way the city was and forced corporations and governments to make action uh, to challenge things. Um, the American radical academic I've mentioned a couple of times, uh, Barry Commoner, responded to Paul Ehrlich in a, in a lovely book called The Closing Circle. Um, and he, he makes the point that, well, I'll quote him, US production has about kept pace with the growth of the US population in the period from 1946 to 1968. This means that overall, production of basic items such as food fabri and fabrics has increased in proportion to the rise in population from 40 to 50%. This overall increase in US production, however, falls far short of the concurrent rise in pollution levels, which is of the range 200 to 2,000%. Um, I think what Barry Commoner gets to the heart of the problem there, that what drives pollution levels is not simply pure uh, I I uh, uh, in in increase in, in numbers. A Guardian article yesterday, uh, rather conveniently for me, um, said that since um, Bolsonaro has taken power in Brazil, uh, the rate of the amount of deforestation of the Amazon rainforest has increased by 88.4%. I'd like to guess that there hasn't been a concurrent increase in population of 88.4% in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil. What's driven that destruction is the fact that Bolsonaro has given a nod and a wink to the big corporations, the agricultural companies, to go into the Amazon to displace the indigenous people and to destroy, uh, 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 destroy that. Production of the capitalism is driven by the desire to make profit, massive profits, and that means that they see the natural world as a source of resources for the production process or a dump for the wastes of that, uh, of that, um, of that process. And by s focusing on consumption, we miss the way that capitalism itself is the biggest contributor to environmental destruction. 99% um, of waste in the produced in the US is a result of industry, not of, uh, of households. Um, so the final thing, really, then, is to argue... Uh, uh, is to take us back to, to the first great critics of uh, Robert Malthus, Marx and Engels. Marx and Engels made a, an obvious point. They argued that what was taking, uh, uh, what the question of overpopulation was one of social context, a political and economic context, not one of uh, absolute laws of population through the ages. 
They wrote, overpopulation is a historically determined relation, in no way determined by abstract numbers or by the absolute limit of the productivity of the necessities of life, but by the limits posited by specific conditions of production. How small the numbers which meant overpopulation for the Athenians appear to us. Um, so those, I think, who argue that overpopulation is the biggest threat to the environment are guilty of making two mistakes. Firstly, they ignore the way that population change and fertility and things like that are the results of social and economic uh, uh, context, not an innate biological drive to have more children over, over time. But more importantly, secondly, they ignore the real threat, which is the economic system that uh, prioritises profit. And, and, and that really is why I argue that overpopulation is a reactionary set of ideas. Um, this was a point also uh, abundantly clear to anyone who reads or read Robert Malthus back in 1798, because what motivated Robert Malthus to write wasn't actually concern about Hungary and poor people. What motivated him to write was the French Revolution. He wanted to actually argue that it was impossible to have a world of equality, of re free and similar access to resources, where everyone had an equal share. Um, he, he, he argued it was totally impossible, because if you did that, then people just had, had dozens and dozens of children, and the whole world would, uh, would, would collapse. It was a political intervention into debates taking place uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in the world around him. And it, that, it, was, uh, it was seized upon by the bourgeoisie, as Marx and Engels then pointed out, as the excuse for, their, uh, for their, the way they were, they were organising. But that's one thing in 1798, but today, it's a bit more insidious today. Um, also, uh, at the time I was preparing this meeting, I was pretty pleased, pleased is the wrong word, I was, uh, it was useful to see that um, the leader um, of uh, Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, met with Viktor Orban, the, um, the, the far-right leader in Hungary, and they issued a joint statement that said the biggest threat to their, the greatest challenge for their mutual economies, Hungary and Myanmar, was a continuously growing Muslim population of the world. Um, and, and really, that's frightening and should ring alarm bells. And really, uh, for us, for socialists, arguing, the, uh, uh, the, arguing for the fight for a sustainable world, I think, means that we have to challenge the question of overpopulation. As I said, we're most likely to encounter it uh, from, if you like, a, a common sense point of view inside, an, inside movements, and argue that, actually, if we want to build a sustainable world, it means challenging capitalism. And actually, what over the overpopulation arguments is, is they, they, they put the question back the wrong way. They blame individuals, uh, usually black and Asian people in sub-Saharan Africa, for the number of children that they have. We have to say, look, it was 100 multinational corporations that have emitted 71% of global emissions since the late 1980s. They're the culprits. They are the organisations that have to be broken. And in a future socialist society, I think women and women will have the freedom to make children choices about the number of children in a much more open and, uh, uh, and clear and a clear way. Today it's a diversion, and uh, and we need uh, and we need to use it to um, uh, to challenge the system. And so I'm much more excited by these young people who've got the system change, not slogan, climate change slogan, rather than people whose starting point is is our individual decisions or uh, how many children they may or may may not have. We need a collective response that challenges capitalism, uh, rather one that blames individuals. Thank you very much. Okay, well, it was a really interesting meeting. Thank you a lot for it. And um, definitely answers a lot of the questions that the general idea of the public is. But um, I just had a few issues with it, and I'm still not completely convinced by everything. I think also it's like, so you're talking about population growth, um, and you're sort of doing predictions on like the way that things are right now. And I think the way that like if population in certain countries is decreasing, we kind of have to think about like, you know, economical situations and social situations and public health care and everything like that that's restraining pub um, population growth. And so um, if we did think about like the way that people would want to have children and the sort of community of care as well that we have, there wouldn't be really anything restricting people from wanting to have as many children as possible. And um, so we can't really predict how the population is going to grow. Um, and even if we can, <laughs> feed the whole world, you know, even if it, if it is a possibility, which I'm sure it is if we sort of change the technology around population um, and like food and the production of things that we need to live, then maybe we can feed the whole world. But I think something that normally people just don't seem to care about when we're talking about climate change is the amount of animals um, that we share the world with. Like, you know, right now the world is owned by the ruling class, but the world isn't even meant to be owned by the working class. We share it with a lot of other things. And I think any more land that we take is too much land to take. Um, if we you know, do feed the whole world and we have 20 billion people on here, are we going to be able to keep the rainforests and keep all of the natural areas that animals need to survive um, like, uh, sustainably 
happily just like still available, you know. So um, um, I was just thinking, you know, if, if we did get to a revolution, just theorising around this uh, situation, um, how would we deal with the fact that maybe we would have a huge population growth? Would that mean that we'd have to put in regulations? Would we have to, you know, tell people, would there have to be a law around these things? That's just the last question that I wanted to put on that. Okay, is that, uh, uh, you could hand it to the gentleman in front, here. Oh, yes. There we go. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Uh, some people from here. <coughs> yeah. Manfred Ecker from Vienna, Austria. Um, I just wanted to hint at one interesting argument uh, that comes out of a survey from the European Union about uh, what people fear most, what they think the greatest dangers are we face. And it's more than 60% of the population in Europe who thinks that climate change is the biggest threat we are facing. And it's almost the same number of people who think that hunger and access to drinking water is uh, the biggest threat. And what I felt when I read this was that there is a dynamic which is going into our direction where, where people are developing progressive, so, um, progressive feelings, progressive thoughts, where, are they, where they are turning left. And in Austria, you know, the, the far right is very strong. And at the same time, the far right is a major climate change denier force in, in Austria. What, not only in Austria, in Italy, in Germany, it's just the same. And I think that uh, the fact that people who care about climate change are turning leftwards is one reason why the far right is denying climate change. Um, Salvini, for example, in Italy and the Austrian far right, they have an argument saying um, we take care, we care about our own population, we take care of the people, we make sure that women dare to have more children. Uh, well, our answer should be, well, you take care that people are getting poorer and that will, that will make them have more children because they need to take, to take care of their own family future. So, so, um, um, addressing this issue in an offensive way from our side, the overpopulation issue, together with the um, with with uh, climate denial and, and um, um, attacking these people for climate denial is something which I, I think I think is quite central for our our campaigns uh, to build a, a strong left. Uh, Park, can, can you take it to Jenny and then? Here. Can I have, I've got lots of people here. Any hands up here? Yes, good. Hi, um, so thank you for your introduction, Martin. I'm really pleased to hear a, um, a discussion on overpopulation and climate change that doesn't in some way hint at apathy to the plight of and or the mass murder of the developing world. Because often when you hear people talking about overpopulation, they say, oh, we, we, need, we need to get rid of people. And it's like, well, how are you gonna do that? and then there's a massive gap and no one says a thing. But more specifically, um, I work in the NHS and I'm an occupational therapist. So what I'm interested in is on an individual and systemic basis, how people do the things they do and why they do it. So I think what, how that relates to sort of the idea of overpopulation and climate change is to argue against, as Martin so eloquently did, the idea that it's just a numbers game, that we have X number of people, they will use X number of resources, and the result will be this. So, and also to answer the, the speaker before, we don't know that there will be, that if there was a revolution, there would be a mass increase in population because we don't know what the determinants around that are gonna be. And I think that's highly influential. But what we do know is that things like working shorter weeks, things like um, more time, um, things like public infrastructure to support social care, all mean that people are, have less of an environmental impact. If there's more infrastructure, people don't feel the need to have families. If there's a shorter working week, people have more time to do things they want. Now, I'm not saying that if people were working a three or a four day week, no one would eat a ready meal ever again, but, because yeah. <laughs> that would be ridiculous, yeah. but if you can imagine the difference, mm. you go to work, you leave the house at seven, mm. you get to work at eight, 
you leave work at six, you get home mm. at seven. Because also, we think about how housing influences this, because you don't work where you live. So you have to travel an hour to get home using lots of costly transport and all that kind of stuff and environmentally impactful. And obviously you want to get home as quickly as you can because um, you get so little time off that you want to go and have a relax. Sorry. So we're going through the day. Are you more or less likely to bang a ready meal in the, in the oven, um, not see your friends, have worse mental health, um, start to sort of indulge in possibly environmentally impactful activities to sort of blast the pain of your working day away? Probably. Then if you lived where you worked, if you didn't have that much time at work, you had more time to do other things. I think we kind of need to think about how the system affects the choices that we make. And that is how the sort of individual and the system um, really affects things. And I really don't think we're going to get out of this through paper straws. I think we're going to have to have a bigger think about this and a bigger think about the system that we live in and what that means for what we as individuals do and therefore affect the system back. That makes sense. All right, thanks. Thank you, Jamie. And it's the gentleman here in the red shirt and then the gentleman there. And then I've got a number of women I'm going to call in who put their hands up. Um, thank you. Thanks, Martin, for that talk. I, I have to say I'm not entirely convinced either, like an earlier speaker was. And I think if one looks at it from another perspective of the consumption that we make, and I know you did note this, but uh, you know there are tens of thousands of workers today who are looking at ways they can encourage us globally, that is, as citizens of the world, to consume more in order that more can be produced, unit costs come down, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you look, for example, at the car industry, uh, four by fours, biggest growth uh, in there. China and India, uh, massive growth in uh, consumer goods, including four by fours, and the very natural desire to have the sort of basic consumer goods that we have. Hundreds of millions every year are moving into that market uh, of being able to consume uh, more and I think perhaps the way in which you were addressing it is underestimating the dynamic of capital how dynamic capitalism still is <clears throat> and what a short time we have to replace it I mean there never I mean I've been active in politics for certainly well over 50 years and never been a time where it's been more urgent for a revolutionary solution and so I, I think the issue of the increase in consumption related to resource resource, uh, limited resources, which I think the climate change emphasis sometimes forgets that actually there are limited resources that are economically available to us. Uh, and the trajectory of the amount that is being produced and going to continue to be produced. Um, there might be a worldwide crash, of course, which the other sessions will deal with, and that, of course, will, will, will impact. But generally speaking, the upward growth plus another four billion uh, who hopefully will enter into a society where they will have those basic uh, requirements that we all take for granted. Uh, I think that does underline the real urgency uh, of the need to replace this, this, dr this production driven for consumerism uh, to be replaced by a more rational socialist society. Could you hand it to the gentleman there, yeah. say Harkin? Thank you. Thanks, Martin. I'm Ian Angus, and Martin made a nice comment on my book, so thanks very much. Simon and I had a lot of very pleased with the response to that. I, I want to pick up a, just a couple of topics. One of them that you didn't talk about it at any length has been the extent to which the overpopulation article, especially uh, argument, especially in the past 20 or 30 years, um, has evolved into an anti-immigrant argument on a large scale. It's used as a justification. Um, you mentioned James Lovelock. You didn't mention that in one of his books, James Lovelock thought the most important thing we could do to, to stop overpopulation is strengthen the British Navy so that, we could, so that you could keep all those horrible immigrants from coming here. Uh, and that it, it was a strictly, and he didn't argue it, you know, he, he's the kind of person you say not a racist bone in his body, except, of course, who's he want to exclude? Um, Population Matters, the organization here in Britain, which goes out of its way to talk about how it's not, you know, not racist and they, they are opposed to all mandatory methods of reducing population and so on, but they're also in favor of basically reducing immigration to, to the UK to zero. Um, and that's characteristically true of the richest countries in the world. 
uh, at the United States, Canada, Australia, we see that use of the population argument as a method of excluding immigrants. Um, and it's, in most cases, not an argument for excluding white immigrants. Um, so I think, that, I think that's an important thing we should bear in mind with this argument is where it leads to. Now that doesn't mean the population argument is automatically wrong if it's misused, but it's something we should be aware of in the content when we get into those discussions. <coughs> the issue of, of the relationship with um, consumption is an extraordinarily complicated one, but typically the population argument is pretty simple. More people consume more, th therefore re re uh, reduce um, resources. And in an absolute sense, that's obviously true. You know, more people are going to eat more. But what are they going to eat? And in what context are they going to eat? Um, meat has become a huge environmental issue because of the, what you're talking about in Brazil and other places. What's seldom raised in these discussions is that in, well, the United States in particular, the per capita consumption of meat is currently between five and six times what it was about 40 years ago. So what you have had is a massive marketing program whose whole purpose is to shift our consumption patterns into products that are extremely profitable. Now you can argue for a vegan or a, a vegetarian response to that. I don't personally, but I don't object to it. Um, however, the key point here is that we live in an irrational society in which the drive for profit ultimately determines what's produced and how it gets produced. Um, we are not, I don't think, as Marxists saying, well, the world could support an infinite number of people. The problem is we don't actually know what overpopulation is because we live in a society in which anything related to population is filtered through capitalism, is filtered through this pro profit-oriented system. Uh, Engels says somewhere, maybe one day we'll discover that we've got too many people. And if we have a rational society, we can make rational decisions about it, but we can't make them now. Yeah, I mean, um, you just spoke about how the argument can end up as a very right-wing argument. What's interesting is how many people from the left are using it who would be horrified um, that it could end up there and reject that, but are still nonetheless taking it on. People might have seen the interviews in The Guardian of young women and activists saying, we're not going to have children, we've made that decision for the environment. And I think one aspect is, is that this idea that's used about, oh my God, there's going to be 10 million people in the world, how are we going to feed the world, is then used by agribusiness, big business, what, you know, Monsanto now bought by Bayer and all these, to go, oh, we can help with this. We'll export a very destructive agricultural model dependent on pesticide, dependent on fertilizer, dependent on multi uh, monoculture. We'll export that and we can be the saviors and they use it and feed into it. The problem is, number one, this is a very colonial view because they want to export it into Africa and Asia as though people can't feed themselves. And we should remember that actually 70% of the world's food is actually grown on 25% of the arable land by smallholders of farmers and peasants. Actually, people do have lots of other ways of, um, of agriculture rather than the big business model. But the point right now is we actually do produce something like one and a half times the amount of food we need. We produce more calories. The reason they don't get to people isn't because it isn't there, it's because of how a system is set up that prevents access to it or people can't afford it or you can't get hold of it in that way and that's the real problem there and we have to challenge that model of agriculture and big business dominating it and trying to export that rather than the numbers of people in the world and I think it's right you see where people, I mean Martin talked about it but you look at capitalism and the waste built in, built in obsolescence so we have to throw away goods, you know we, our resources could be used in a much better way but they want us to buy more to keep making profit from it and I would say we have to argue the problem is one of capitalism and not overpopulation we also have to argue that actually people, we're talking about people, Martin made the point, one minute left, have got capacity. We, you know, people can actually struggle within capitalism totally, always, about what sort of system we live under. And I think that people have been very inspired 
by movements like Extinction Rebellion, which are actually about system. They say, let's point it upwards, let's look at systemic problems rather than individuals, and the school student strikes. We've got an opportunity, though. On the 20th of September, that is the call out for the strike for climate. We have been called out across the globe to walk out on strike. That is when it hits the profits of this system. If we're talking about big change, how do we join the school students on the streets and try and organise work, uh, walkouts from our workplaces, from our colleges, from our universities, to start challenging challenging all the priorities of the system and have a collective response rather than these individualised responses that actually can lead in very dangerous directions. Yes, I wanted to, um, to pick up the very first point and to challenge the idea that um, more social provision will lead to more population growth because I think, um, as in fact Martin, the, the, the graphs that Martin put up actually they show the reverse, and the reverse is true. Um, better medicine, you know, a, a socialised NHS, um, decent pensions, decent social provision, means you don't need to fall back on your family for all social care. You don't need to have lots of children to look after people. You don't have to depend on, well, I suppose the, the family is in a way, it's a very privatised way of providing social care. You know that you will be looked after, that there will be collective solutions to your problems. And in fact, it has been seen that where you have better social provision, the population does go down. People don't need to depend on large families. For, for, uh, Martin's graph, graphs showed that in areas of the world where there's poor social provision, that's where population is increasing. And where there's better social provision, it decreases. So we do have to challenge this idea that keeping a safe and healthy and properly provided to all for will increase the population. The absolute reverse is true. The second thing to say is that providing things socially without the profit motive reduces uh, climate destruction. Um, I'm old enough to remember the time after World War II in the 50s and 60s when you had um, collective in solutions being introduced, for example, to transport problems. So you had a much better railway system and you had, you had uh, decent buses, you had trolley buses in a lot of cities. All of that was destroyed for profit when Ernest Marples shut down all of these things and threw his uh, weight behind, as transport minister behind um, uh, fossil fuel based cars, roads, built ultimately the new motorways. Absolutely climate destructive and a wonderful infrastructure for public transport was actually destroyed. You just don't see those trolley buses anymore in big cities. Within, I think, two days of Theresa May announcing that the UK would go carbon neutral by 2050, we had two decisions um, which proved that the profit motive always trumps environmental motives for this government. They decided to go ahead with the third runway at Heathrow, another runway at Heathrow, and not to do anything meaningful about the textile industry. And that just shows that profit is absolutely always going to win. And until we challenge the profit-based system, we will get nowhere. Thank you. Camilla. So stay up there, Harkin. Uh, okay, I think this is a really, really interesting to be, and some of what I was going to say has already been said, but I'm just going to add a couple of points. Um, first of all, the position of women, I think, is absolutely vital to the whole discussion about um, overpopulation. Um, I totally agree with the social care. You know, if you're providing social care, then you don't have to have big families to do it for us. But actually, the other thing as well is, like, once if you imagine that we are you know, involved in a revolutionary situation where women are involved in it, political engagement and actually being out of the home is vital for getting women you know, away from the idea that their role in life is to have children. So actually, the more politically engaged you are in, the, in societies where women are educated, but actually, not just it's not just about formal education, it's actually where societies where women are politically involved in stuff, then actually, you know, there's, you know, there's probably going to be less um, not opportunity, but less desire to have children and stay at home. So I think liberation of women is absolutely crucial to this argument. The second thing I just want to pick up on is the racism of it as well. There was a kind of, I can't remember because I wasn't really prepared for this meeting and I didn't do any research, but there was a recently, fairly recently, a European country. I've got a weird feeling it was Denmark, but I could be wrong. Very low population, very, I mean, they're actually not replacing their population. 
But the problem is what they're worried about is they're not pl replacing the white Danish population. That's what they're bothered about. And that's how it comes across in co white European countries when you talk about, oh my God, we're worrying about, un uh, about low, um, decreasing fertility. It's because what they're bothered about is decreasing white fertility. So there's absolute racist undercore to this. And just the final, just the final, final point. Somebody mentioned about India or whatever, you know, countries that are getting richer. The rich are going to buy big cars, all the rest of it. That's probably true. The most unequal countries are the most polluting. But the, the solution to that is that Indian, you know, Indian social movements, and there are such things, you know, farmers have fought against Monsanto in India, you know, and it's people in India themselves that are going to say, you know, to hell with more um, 4 by 4 is what we need is a decent public transport system. about the position of women um, as well actually. I think um, Martin talked about Malthus and it's quite uh, sort of interesting, actually sort of funny how right in the 18th century he didn't just had no idea about what uh, women, contraception or abortion or things like that would look like. He thought the only way you could reduce the population I think was through misery or vice. So misery means basically you just abstain from sex completely and vice means you, you catch a disease which people thought would make you, would make you um, not be able to have kids anymore. Um, but I mean yeah, more, more kind of, uh, uh, yeah, seriously. Uh, but I think, you know, oh, quite often actually the argument about overpopulation um, can link to arguments about, about women's liberation. So the idea is, you know, people in the South will, um, you yeah, know, get more control over their bodies. So I think, yeah, you know, it, it can seem like quite a progressive argument because it's linked to those issues about, about women's liberation. But I think they're, they're kind of separate issues, really. I think we should just be in favour of women's liberation as an end in itself. Um, but someone was telling me that. Um, in Nigeria, abortion is completely illegal, um, but there's still there's nearly half a million abortions every year in that country, and you can just imagine the kind of suffering that that, that involves. Uh, I think you know, we, and there's very little access to contraception or education about contraception and things as well. I think yeah, you know, so we should absolutely be in favour of women having control over what they do with their own their own bodies, um, regardless of whether it makes any difference to. To climate change or not. I mean, a lot of people, uh, as Martin said, in the South have very little impact on in terms of, of climate um, in any case. Thank you. And then the last speaker will be the woman here. Apologies, there are about eight people who had their hands, but I did call me old fashioned, but I did actually prioritise women who often put their hands up a bit later. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, well, yes, so everybody's made some uh, very good points here. I mean, um, but uh, particularly following Ian and Amy, I mean, Amy's point about we already have one and a half times the number of calories on Earth that we need to feed everyone. There is no reason for anyone to go hungry um, in our current society. And, and yet we have this enormous problem of access to food. And we have the... Um, the, the sort of problem facing it that millions and millions of poor people in the developed world have access to really low quality food because it's cheap. So it makes you fat. It's full of trans fats, it's full of sugar and salt and stuff. And this, you know, the, the obesity epidemic is not because we're all so happy with our lives. Living in capitalism is hard and it's getting harder. And our levels of alienation mean not just that we comfort eat, but what the food we can afford to eat actively makes us ill. So I think we have to be very clear about this. And I think, you know, we, we've seen the extreme weather events this year so far, and at some point, I would expect um, there, will be, there will be some news headline about food shortages, about there'll be some, you know, the maize crop in America will not be its bumper sort of years and, um, and the point we have to remember is there are enormous stocks of food in the world, but what there is also is people speculating on it. Yeah. And that's what drives the price of food, and that's what means that you know another million people in America will be forced into um, poverty, another section of farmers will go bankrupt and all the rest of it. And I would just finish with the point that um, the average income on an American farm is minus $1,500 a year. So when we're thinking about 
suicides amongst farmers, and we all know about the epidemic of suicides in the Indian subcontinent. It's worth remembering that there is an epidemic of suicides in American farmers as well. And this is what this society, this is what capitalism has brought us to. Okay, thank you very much for all your contributions. I found that absolutely fascinating. So Martin's going to come back on some of that for about 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, okay, thank you, comrades. Always, always interesting and thoughtful and, and that's useful. I, I, I do respond. Firstly, the couple of direct questions that I had from uh, right at the start. Um, in an affluent world, there'd be nothing to restrict people. The, the problem is, is exactly the opposite happens. In an affluent society, women don't have as many children as they do in poorer nations. And there's, there's some very interesting studies, for instance. One, there's, there's a notable study that shows how immigrants coming to somewhere like the UK, let's say someone comes from, I don't know, somewhere in Sub-Saharan Africa, where on average women would have four and a half children or, or thereabouts, and they come to a country like Britain where on average women now have 1.8 children. What happens is they tend to have the number of children of the local average, or if they don't, their, their children definitely do. Um, because what determines it is not their background or their origin or you know what country they come from. What determines it is the uh, the society around them, uh, their access to resources, their access to the welfare state, and uh, and uh, and so on. And all around the world, in a number of different ways, and often, sometimes for different reasons, we're seeing countries reducing. Their, um, their, uh, their, their, their populations, and sometimes they're quite surprising. I mean, Japan, for instance, has a very aging population, and is, uh, and uh, 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 but population is, is is declining. Germany, Italy, I've mentioned or, or already, and um, China. People always used to use, and I was young, China as the place where the world was going to get, we were going to get drowned by the yellow, yellow peril. Um, but actually China's population is expected to peak uh, in 2029 at about 1.44 billion, and then decline by 2065 to about 1.17 uh, uh, billion billion people. Quite a big decline, actually, uh, taking it back to levels that it was in 1990, around the time of Tiananmen Square. And, and so actually... This then begins to tie in to questions of consumption, because actually one of the uh, uh, arguments is that's driving environmental uh, uh, crisis is all, all the Chinese people suddenly deciding to eat meat. But actually their population is going to decline. So actually how is this going to, uh, to, to drive that? And I think that this we have to see. Consumption is a result of, of, of the system, not an innate thing that people do as, uh, as, as individuals. People mention the Western diet you know, heavy in beef and rich foods and, and the rest of it. But the Western diet is a construct. It's invented in the post-war period, partly a, a, as, a, as a way for uh, uh, American grain corporations to use up the overproduction of grain that they had in the Midwest and to find a source for it. So they, 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 they fed it to beef and then they had to find a way of selling it. So they said to Americans, hey, eat more steak. It makes you manly and American and it's, very, it's great to eat hamburgers. Uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, a couple of years ago I spoke on this at Marxism. There's a wonderful advert advertising poster that says something like, you know, you're more American if you eat more hamburgers, and that may well be, well be true, but actually people went away and did that, and that means that actually the diet that they chose, this Western diet, was enforced and encouraged and driven uh, by wider economic and, and political, uh, political interests. I'll, I'll come back to the question of consumption in a minute, because so, I want to focus again on the question of food, and, and, and the question of overpopulation in the past has been very much dominated by hunger rather than, than environmental destruction, and that changed in the, in, in the 70s, as I, as I said. But as comrades have probably pointed out, there's far more food available um, today than, the, than, than that, that would feed, feed the world, and, and, and people shouldn't, shouldn't go hungry. But also the other interesting thing is, is actually we don't produce anywhere near as much food because uh, the nature of capitalist agriculture, because it's driven by profit, um, it tends to behave in a particularly way that's bad for, for yield. So the monocropped, massive um, farms, whoever chose the picture in the Socialist Review article to illustrate my article, is a, is a really shocking <laughs> photograph of, asp of uh, um, asparagus monoculture in, in South America. Um, actually, this way of producing food, because it's ma it's, it maximises profits, actually lowers the level of, um, of, uh, of yields quite dramatically. And if you want a sustainable food supply, if you want more food, actually you have to challenge the 
food corporations and agriculture and, uh, and so on. And there's other ways, for instance, that agriculture tends to uh, undermine food supply, ironically enough. For instance, the production of biofuels uh, burns off a lot of, um, of the food that could be, that could be uh, viable food for, um, for, for, for the population. So again, the problem is, is, is the capitalist agricultural system, not the, uh, uh, not the number of people um, who, who, who are or aren't being fed. Um, quite rightly, a number of comrades have focused on the question of the links between the overpopulation argument and racism and, uh, and immigration and so on. If anyone's had the misfortune to accidentally read a, a Generation Identity uh, leaflet, it's the far-right fascist organisation that's tried to organise on a, a couple of campuses in the, uh, in the UK and has been challenged uh, by stamp to racism and, uh, and so on. Actually, you'll find at the heart of this, this concern as people have identified of identity. We're losing identity. It's being drowned out. It's being, you know, it's being uh, 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 ruined by, by people. Our population decline and the influx of, of immigration. And, and, and there's a long tradition of far-right and fascist organisations having, having, uh, having similar, uh, 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 similar arguments, this fear of, uh, uh, of a future that isn't somehow, isn't somehow white. Um, and, and, and I think this is, this is um, uh, uh, true, and one, one of the things it shows is the enormous irrationality of racism. I mean, you know, we live in, in, in countries, you know, I mentioned Germany, where actually if you don't have immigration, your country will actually suffer severe problems. You will not be able to have uh, health care or support in the, uh, in the future, you will not have, a, because there won't be anyone to pay the pension or, or, uh, or, or, um, or, or look after you. And sometimes this is quite dramatic. I mean, Germany's population decline is going to be uh, quite large, but... Um, the number of old people is going to dramatically rise, and actually, if the racists do have their their way forward, um, they will they they will um, they will suffer. Um, but I wanted again to come back to the final point about the nature of capitalism and production, because I think this is the key point. Really, I said in the first half that 99% of waste in the United States comes as a result of uh, uh, of industrial processes, not um, uh, uh, not households, and actually. More than that, the problem, I think, is the nature of capitalist society and capitalist production itself. You see, its starting point is that it has to strip the world bare to make profits. And in doing so, behaves utterly, utterly irrationally to the, uh, the planet. There's that lovely quote, which I'm sure comrades remember, of, from Engels, where he talks about the, the coffee trees in Cuba and how the, the planters stripped, the, uh, you know, stripped all the forests to make the, um, uh, uh, the area more, more able to produce coffee. And then the... Um, and then the storms came and washed the topsoil away, and they weren't, be able to, they weren't able to have a crop the next, uh, the, the, the following year. And capitalism does that on a systematic level. It undermines its ability to, to, to re reproduce itself by destroying the, the environment. But capitalism is also made up of all those different competing blocks of capital, all those firms, all those multinationals, all those corporations that are in competition against each other, which leads to enormous waste of resources because they do two things. The first thing they do is they make too many things. They make too many widgets, too many cars, too many, you know, the goods that they cannot sell. And all of those represented waste, re represent wasted human labor, wasted natural resources, wasted time and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and money. All of that is detrimental. So actually, irrespective of someone, whether, whether someone consumes a commodity or not it's still wasteful and the particular nature of capitalism makes it more uh, and more um, more wasteful itself um, I think there's a, a figure from Helen um, he 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 Heather, Heather Rogers uh, an American uh, writer who says that something like 80% of American manufactured goods are used once and then thrown away that's a that's a that's not because of consumption that's because of a system that doesn't reuse recycle and uh, and uh, and and so on because it's more profitable to do that and in this context I think it is quite hopeful and I think it's right that, that our friend from Austria said that the dominant argument inside the the environmental movement is from the uh, from from the left I think that one of the things that we can be proud of here in the UK is that actually the socialist left, the SWP in particular, has been part of shaping a particular response to uh, the environmental movement that put the onus on trying to involve working class and trade union organisation, collective solutions, alternate methods of production and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Um, I think it's interesting that there's a long tradition of environmentalists and scientists working together over these, uh, these questions. Um, but also, I think... Um, Social movements themselves have helped transform the things. Actually, I think Extinction Rebellion has shaped the environmental movement in, uh, in, in, in 2020 in a way that, uh, that, that wasn't expected because they started from the system is driving extinction. That's a really, really positive thing. They, they could easily have gone a, there could easily have been a movement that had developed in the UK that had said the problem is too many people, the problem is individual consumption, or we all got to be vegan, vegans and so on. In, in, instead, actually, the people at the heart of Extinction Rebellion drove an argument 
argument that there's a problem with the system that we live in. Now, they may not have driven, risen from that with a conclusion that we need socialism or so on, but actually their starting point is on the, on the left, and they are willing to reach out to the left, to the trade union movement, to the community organisations, to anti-racist organisations, to make that better. And I think we have to be part of shaping that as, uh, as, as well. And, and Amy's quite right, and I will finish on this, and I hope it's a theme of Marxism. I think the 20th of September in the UK is an absolute crucial starting point for us, because I think on the 20th of September you can have two, two responses to it. You can say, do you know what, nothing's going to really happen because the TUC will never call a strike. Or you can say, Extinction Rebellion has shown that in the UK, millions of people are worried about the future and about the environment, want to do something, and what can we do? Who can we mobilise? How can we get people out on the streets? How can we have joint activity between climate strikers and students and environmentalists and trade unionists? And I think actually we will start to see, uh, 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 we will see, um, we'll see, start to see that coming together. So I think everything is to play for, and we can be part of shaping a response that puts the blame absolutely on capitalism, absolutely on this system that puts profit before people, that leaves a tiny minority rich and the millions of other people poor. And actually that's the system that destroys our planet and that's why we're socialists and why we want to build an alternative.